Welcome to tonight's episode of Beyond Focus TV. I'm your host, Lydia Patel, and tonight we have a very special feature for you. We'll be showing you a documentary brought to you by USAID, showing you all about the traditional methods of cooking with charcoal in Haiti. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. We're going to go in-depth, of course, once again brought to you by USAID. Stay with us. Beyond Focus TV allows you to discuss contemporary topics affecting the Caribbean people on both the national and local level. The show features informed guests who offer insight, debate, and evaluate various issues. Beyond Focus TV builds on the station's mission to provide useful information to the Caribbean people in New York and abroad. Beyond Focus TV, where our viewing audience can get educated, informed, and empowered. Nowhere else in the Caribbean do I see people using charcoal as, as in Haiti. We have seen uh, negative effects from uh, charcoal use. Charcoal production, if it's done unsustainably, has devastating consequences. The forests are disappearing at an alarming rate, and one of the main causes for it is because 95% of Haitians cooks exclusively with charcoal. Imagine nous que arbre fruitier yo coupé pour faire charbon. Si m'ta pose une question, m'ta mandé qui est-ce qui a raison ou bien qui est-ce qui coupable dans question dévastation environnement. Nous t'a joindre tout le monde coupable parce que ou utiliser charbon ou coupable. Haiti is at a crossroads. An unsustainable demand for charcoal has caused a relentless cycle of deforestation, creating widespread and damaging erosion. Nutrient-rich topsoil and any attempt to grow crops wash away with the seasonal rains, carrying with it the trash and solid waste that clog Haiti's waterways. On the precipice of environmental ruin, can Haiti reverse its fate? I'm really in Nigeria. I'm in Pétionville. And we're going to eat the morning, the midi. Imani Girard begins her day like most women in the capital city of Port-au-Prince, trekking to a local market to buy food and charcoal. Parfois, pour acheter des malcabarems, pour acheter un petit sac, si ça coûte moins pour un petit sac de riz, moins pour 30 ou 40 dollars, il compte faire 15 jours. Mais les acheter ici. Imani isn't alone. Haitians spend nearly one third of their income on charcoal, usually small quantities at a time, an amount equal in size to a large coffee can, which Haitians call a marmite. Je vais faire manger mes petits de charbon. Les choses traditionnelles. Ça va? On se va faire manger trois fois par jour. Comme utiliser des bâtiments de charbon. Although families are rationing their, their expenditures and buying what would it equate to two dollars or maybe even a dollar uh, of charcoal per day. When you expand that to a month, they've actually spent a lot of money. In the capital city of Port-au-Prince, street food vendors, or mangequites, are found on nearly every street corner. There are about 7,500 mangequites in Haiti, and collectively, they consume more than 150,000 tons of charcoal every year. Heavy charcoal users, like the vendors in this eatery, feed people working nearby. Every 
Denise Roquefort is one of the food vendors here where the open grate stoves burn the charcoal rapidly and inefficiently. Les gens font, on peut acheter mais sur lui, on peut acheter pour 50 dollars, 40 dollars, mais sur lui encore fait 150 dollars. Les gens font, mais tant que les gens font, nous servir avec un sac de charbon chaque jour. The high cost of charcoal is compounded by the negative impact it has on the well-being of the Haitian people. La fumée même pas bon pour les yeux, parce qu'il est malade dans les yeux. Pas bon pour moi, pour grand monde, si mon a plus mal. Parce que moi, grand monde, pas qu'à respirer, si bébé a plus mal. Parce que des fois, mon yeux viennent manger la sonne plein mon yeux, mon yeux pas même plein, chit à même. People are breathing in the, the fumes, uh, which may or may not be visible. Chabon, les chabon cher yon, les fin encore les cuit fois, et puis encore les fait tourner toujours non et avec chabon, je suis sous ta genou là dedans, c'est vite la plus mieux que chabon. Si me donne une possibilité, me donne changer déjà, il va améliorer. Haiti and the Dominican Republic share the island of Hispaniola. It sits in the Caribbean island chain called the Greater Antilles, just 650 miles to the southeast of the continental United States. Of the 10 million people that live here, 95% use fuel wood or charcoal for cooking. In Port-au-Prince alone, more than 400,000 tons of charcoal are burned as cooking fuel every year but the country can only sustainably produce 70,000 tons. Nearly 20 million trees are cut every year to meet this demand. There's a very simple equation when it comes to Haiti's energy dilemma. Um, the country remains dependent on wood as a source of energy, and much of that wood is turned into charcoal. The reserves of wood have diminished severely to the point where there's very little forest left in Haiti. I think there's about 2% coverage in Haiti, uh, and it's, it's sadly very visible when you're flying over the island. The cutting of trees for charcoal production has created a visible border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and illegal logging in the Dominican Republic has intensified in order to supply Haiti with charcoal. But Haiti's history with deforestation is long and complicated. Columbus first uh, sailed into the Bay d'Acoul in, in the north part of Haiti. He saw what he said was the most beautiful place he had ever seen in the world. It was covered with forests. After Haiti fell under French rule, sugarcane became its major export. To create these plantations, the French had to go about the dirty deed of beginning the deforestation of Haiti. Then came the harvesting of Haiti's hardwoods for export to France and the French went about the business during the colonial period of targeting and felling precious tropical hardwood trees, mahogany being for one example of it, throughout the islands. So another instance of, of deforestation. By the late 18th century, most of Haiti's lush tropical forest had been cut, chopped, harvested, or tilled over. And then something extraordinary happened. Haiti became independent in 1804 following a 13-year uh, revolution and essentially the, the, the enslaved people of Haiti um, rose up to cast off um, not just the colonial power of France but also to free themselves from slavery and, and they achieved both um, which was a miraculous event at the time. This cast a kind of a fear among Haiti's neighbors that Haiti, as the first domino to fall, in a sense, in, in cracking the facade of the slavery system, could then spread to where they were. In fact, 
The first thing the U.S. did uh, after Haiti's independence was to slap an embargo on Haiti. So the idea was to make it so that Haiti would not work, to weaken Haiti and make it fail. A financial blow came when France demanded that Haiti pay 150 million francs in reparation for loss of property and income as a result of the war. It took Haiti a century to pay that debt. The irony of all this is that Haiti was forced to pay the French these reparations, which included their own cost as people. Then, during the First World War, the United States sent Marines to occupy Haiti. In a sense, as a preemptive move to keep Germans out. Um, and then the U.S., uh, through the U.S. Marines, ruled Haiti for 19 years until 1934. It was the longest uh, occupation in U.S. history of any country in the world. After World War II, Haiti suffered a tumultuous succession of brutal dictators. Compounded with a series of natural disasters, Haiti quickly became a nation in need. Haiti is known as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Some say that's Haiti's last name. In recent decades, an unregulated charcoal production industry has contributed to the scarring of an already denuded land. Charcoal production, if it's done unsustainably, um, is uh, a great driver of deforestation. So it has devastating consequences. The, the whole chain, unfortunately, is not set up to be sustainable, and that's the major problem. Haiti's 10 million people live in an area the size of the state of Maryland. And for the overpopulated city of Port-au-Prince, unsustainable deforestation has had crippling effects. The south of Haiti was particularly devastated with thousands of people killed and injured in floods and landslides in particular. So there are no roots to really hold the soil and when the rain comes, everything goes with it. A really rugged country, very mountainous. Um, trees are critical um, uh, in terms of maintaining the soil when you have rainstorms and, and you denude the hillsides and it just washes all the way down and um, takes a lot of soil with it. Haiti, a nation with almost insurmountable challenges, with many difficult and complex problems. Amidst a backdrop of deforestation is a crumbling infrastructure, high rates of illiteracy, and limited access to clean water. In a country where an overwhelming majority of Haitians live in extreme poverty, it's easy to despair. But throughout Haiti, rays of hope have emerged. Dedicated entrepreneurs creating cooking solutions that have reduced charcoal consumption and will help restore Haiti's environment. Paya gain 2% de couverture végétale. 2%. Mwarele, Giselle, Piram, Farah. Ma dirige lutte SA. C'est en entreprise de gaz, propane, et nous confectionnons tout des réchauds à gaz propane. My name is Drakeen Fednard, and we are at the DNA Green, um, DNA Green Enterprise Factory, where we manufacture efficient cooking stove for the Haitian market. Moi, c'est Serge Jean-Baptiste, PDG de Jean-Baptiste Entreprise. Nous avons environ 12 personnes qui travaillent ensemble avec nous. Nous avons regardé, moi, Comment les pieds bois ont dévasté dans le pays hein? Comment nous avons pu utiliser le bois pour faire le charbon pour être capable de faire manger Et je me dis moi-même, je suis prêt à contribution. Imaginez-nous un instant pour nous regarder tout le monde, le pays noir, qui était tellement belle dans les temps anciens, qu'on y a nous réduit à quelques petits pieds bois. Comme Haïtien. C'est toujours rêve moi. C'est toujours rêve moi pour me porter aide. On côté. C'est un coup son mission. I was really tired of the image of Haitians or the kind of people who are waiting for people to come do for them and I wanted to do for my country. So I decided like you know to leave my comfortable life in New York to come back 
because I needed to feel like, you know, as an Asian person, I contribute to the development of my country. It is really important for the local entrepreneurs to be a part of the solution.